take a video like this at home, you need a location with a clear view of Polaris where you can leave your camera set up for a full 24 hours without it being messed with. You need a way to power a camera for 24 hours because no camera stock battery is going to be able to run a camera for a full 24 hours, uh, let alone longer than that to give you some splice time. And uh, third, you of course need a camera and that camera needs to be able to automatically take pictures every couple minutes and it needs to be able to adjust to changing light conditions because of course taking a picture in the dark is not the same as taking a picture at noon. My first attempt at a 24 hour time lapse was over the summer in North Carolina and we live in the absolute middle of nowhere so I was very certain you can just go set up a tripod outside and know that it's not going to be messed with for 24 hours. I was also able to power the camera just with an AC adapter and some extension cords running from the observatory. Unfortunately this time lapse did not go very well because uh, although the first part of the night was good, it uh, the camera got dewed over in the morning and there was all sorts of fog that ruined like half of the early morning footage and uh, then the next night it was cloudy so I was trying to splice cloudy footage into not cloudy footage and it just didn't work. So I have kept trying. I think that this is like my fifth attempt maybe and I finally got something that I really like. Out here in California, the uh, I guess other four times that I've tried to do this time lapse, I have just set up the camera in the living room, uh, pointed out the window to the north. And the good news about that is that it's no no morning dew can possibly get on the camera to mess up the lens. Uh, there's power right there, uh, literally just plugged into the wall with an AC adapter. And there's no pedestrian traffic in our living in the corner of our living room by the window, so I didn't need to worry about the camera moving over the 24-hour span. The uh, difficulty is that now you're looking through a window, so you have to block all of the excess reflections that you get, especially at night when it's dark outside and it's light inside, and you're getting reflected light off the window back into the camera. That can be a problem. I ended up building a shroud out of two towels. Uh, a t-shirt and uh, the base layer was a large piece of dark colored felt that I had left over from making a wizard's hat this spring. The camera that I used for this was this uh, Sony Alpha A6000 with this 12 millimeter lens. It uh, is a full manual lens, even the, uh, the aperture is on a ring here. And it goes all the way down to f2, which is awesome for taking like Milky Way pictures that are single static pictures, but if you're trying to set this camera up so that it can take good pictures in the middle of the night or in the middle of the day, uh, not having electronic control of the aperture is actually, uh, it makes that quite a challenge because you want to give the camera as much adjustability as it can to be able to go from nighttime shots to daytime shots and vice versa. The daytime here in Santa Barbara is about a million times brighter than the nighttime here in Santa Barbara when you're looking out the window. And for those of you familiar with photography, that is 20 full optical stops of, of light difference. So if you're trying to set up a camera to take a good picture out the window, uh, you will need to set it up 20 stops faster at night than in the middle of the day. I had the camera set up in aperture priority mode for this time lapse which means that every time that it was about to take a picture, it looked at the picture that it was about to take and said, how much light is there in this image? And figured out how long it wanted to hold the shutter open and it got to pick that value. So the fastest that it can activate the shutter is one four thousandth of a second. That's really darn fast. You don't bring in a whole lot of light in one four thousandth of a second. Now, the slowest that it will automatically set the shutter to go is 30 seconds. So one four thousandth of a second to one thirtieth of a second is a huge difference in how much light comes in. It's like 120,000 times difference or something like that. But that's still not enough. That's only 17 optical stops. So you still need more variability than the shutter alone will give you. I have done this with electronic lenses. The first time I tried this with uh, in North Carolina, I was using an electronic lens that allowed for the camera to control the aperture. So you could just literally make the hole all the light was coming through bigger or smaller. And uh, that would give you your extra light variability. Unfortunately, with this lens, because it's a manual lens, I do not have electronic aperture control. Just 
manual aperture control uh, by turning the dial. So I was unable to use the aperture to give me those extra three stops of light variability that I need because uh, the camera can't turn this crank. So I had to resort to using an automatic ISO, which I I'm normally would not be a fan of. It, it basically, the ISO is like an artificial enhancement of the light that's there. It's an electronic thing. It's very similar to taking a dark image in uh, a, a image editing program on the computer and just artificially brightening the whole thing. Uh, so it's not great, but it is uh, something that the camera can do by itself in order to take these pictures, which is what I needed. So I ended up setting up an auto ISO to go between uh, 100 and 800, which the difference in that is two to the third, so that gives me my extra three stops that I needed. And that means that if you add the three stops of variability of the ISO to the 17 stops of variability of the shutter speed, I get my full 20 stops of variance that let me take nighttime pictures or daytime pictures. In the middle of the night, the camera is shooting at an ISO of 800 and it's holding the shutter open for 30 seconds. And in the middle of the day, the camera is shooting at an ISO of 100 and it's only holding the shutter open for a four thousandth of a second. So it's capturing so much less light in the middle of the day than in the middle of the night. But that's what's necessary in order to take a time lapse that spans days. So I had the camera mounted on this tripod sideways, pointed up at about a 30 degree angle, uh, which here in Santa Barbara is how high you've got a point to hit Polaris, and pointed exactly north. So that Polaris was in the center of the camera frame and uh, with the whole shroud behind it, the camera was ready to physically be able to take pictures. You can go online and buy an intervalometer for a camera, which is basically a box with a wire that plugs into the side of the camera and it will activate the shutter at a specified interval in order to take uh, time lapses. So you're just basically taking picture after picture. The computer is pressing the button on the top of the camera for you. That's great, but you know, it's a lot more fun to try to build one yourself. So this is an external uh, shutter release where you can hold it down or press it in to hold down the shutter for a long time or something like that. This is, I think this was the cheapest thing that I could order on Amazon that would do this and plug into this camera. And uh, so it plugs in with this multi USB port. It's a really weird port, but I modified this. You will notice this does not look like the picture from Amazon because it has this extra little plug off to the side. And that extra little plug attaches to this Arduino and um, optocoupler circuit that plugs in just like that. And when you power this Arduino, you can make the Arduino send pulses to the optocoupler, and the optocoupler completes the circuit that would normally be completed by pressing this button. So the Arduino is the timer that actually activated this camera every two minutes for a whole day. Once you get everything set up and the camera shroud is set and the timing is set and the uh, camera is aimed properly and all of the uh, camera settings are right, then you get to walk away for like a day and a half and let it take pictures and then come back and pull out an SD card with like 20 or 30 gigabytes worth of garbage for your computer to try to churn through in Lightroom later. I actually, for this fifth attempt, actually took two full days of footage and sliced the best day out of that, where I would have the best opportunity to splice the end of the day into the beginning of the day and make it look like it was one cohesive unit. And I had a lot of data that I brought off the camera. I actually took that segment that I wanted, once I picked my segment, the one day segment, um, I ended up rendering about a day and a half worth of pictures through Lightroom twice. Once, uh, optimized so that you could see the stars really well and optimized for nighttime pictures. And then another another full set of renderings through Lightroom for optimizing in the day. So that took a long time. But running all of the nighttime pictures, I think literally took like maybe seven or eight hours through, the, through Lightroom on my ThinkPad. My ThinkPad really hates me through combination of Lightroom and MATLAB, I, I abuse my computer greatly. But once you have a time lapse optimized for nighttime and a time lapse optimized for daytime, you can take those into your favorite video editor and just splice them so that it fades from the nighttime optimized to daytime optimized, nighttime optimized, 
and go back and forth. And that will give you one time lapse that looks good at night and good in the day. And uh, it is one continuous segment. Once you have your single cohesive video that is a day and night optimized time lapse for over 24 hours, you basically find one spot. It's easiest to do this at night because there's stars and you can align it exactly. But you find a time of day in one at the, at the end of the clip and you copy the clip and you move it and you find that same time of day or same time of day relative to the stars at the beginning of the clip so that you align the end of the clip to the beginning of itself. And then you can trim it so that it's exactly 24 hours long and then you can fade the clip into its own beginning so that you're left with something that looks continuous because if you do a, a slow fade uh, of one picture into another picture that should look almost nearly identical uh, it's very difficult to notice the splice. In my time lapse the only continuity error that I was able to see was the fact that the window on the side of the building uh, moved ever so slightly and at dusk you can see that that's where I chose to splice the footage and the window moves not immediately as if it were in time lapse but it moves by fading out of this place and fading into another place so it's a slight error but considering that everything else came out really well I stuck with it. At this point you basically have a loopable GIF. <laughs> it's, it's a time lapse, it lasts for 24 hours and if you've done the splicing really well it just looks like it's day after day after day but if you are really paying attention you can see that the exact same things happen every day so it's only one day of time lapse but it's been looped and the uh, video could just be left that way if you want to see it that way but what I wanted to do was to do the freeze the stars and make the earth move around them and I did that by just taking my final uh, complete time lapse and the exact middle of my frame was Polaris, which meant that I could just take the video, uh, keyframe it at the beginning vertically, and then keyframe it at the end of the video uh, vertically plus 360 degrees. So that through the length of the entire video, it will flip itself all the way over exactly once. And that's all you need to do. If you've got a 24 hour time lapse or a 23 hour and 56 minute time lapse like this one, then you just have to make it rotate once and any reasonable video editing software should be able to do that. I also added a uh, round black mask so that it would round off the top and bottom edge of my image so that it would look like it was sort of rotating within a circle. Someday I want to do this with either a fisheye lens or looking up at like the side of a mountain or something so that I can uh, just get one circular frame for the entire image and make the circular frame move in a circle and that would look a lot better than having these bars on the side but for right now that's all I was able to do. So I hope you found these videos interesting. I guess here at the end of part three if you're still watching you probably did. Uh, if you end up trying this at home and anybody actually gets a, a Polaris lapse like this one I would love to see it so be sure to uh, link it over to my YouTube account or mention me on Reddit and uh, thanks for watching. And as soon as it dims away and stops emitting any light, you turn off the, uh, the camera, or close the shutter and turn off the camera, and you're done capturing your image. If all went to plan, you'll get some really awesome streak images like these, where you can see the entire path of the flare as it gets bright and moves across the sky and then fades away. I think they're pretty cool. When you're taking long exposures of the night sky, you might even get bonus satellites. This picture of the flare from the satellite Iridium-10 also capture the trails from two Soviet-era communication satellites.